This is a must watch. It is one of the most powerful videos and interviews we have ever done on this channel. This woman who you are about to see was conceived and raped and she was aborted, but the abortion failed. And so she ended up living and now she's changing lives all around the world on different continents up to the highest politicians because one life can make such a powerful difference. And we have no idea the plan of God for each and every every individual person. This interview will blow you away, so stay tuned. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Catholic Truth Podcast, where we teach and preach the Catholic faith that comes down to us from Jesus Christ, our Lord, and his apostles over 2,000 years. We want to help you to know your faith, love your faith, and live your faith with purpose and passion, and to be set on fire for it, to be set on fire for Christ. And so on this channel, as you know, we do a lot of apologetics and spirituality and life and living, but we also have a lot of people who come on and share their testimonies once in a while, or who have written in books or who have a story of some kind. And today we have an amazing guest and her name is Rebecca Kiesling. And she is a pro-life speaker and has been a pro-life speaker and adoption speaker since 1995. And if you haven't heard of her before, she's known because she was conceived in rape. And many people say, oh, well, what you have to make exceptions for rape and abortion and exceptions for incest. And you have to make certain exceptions. And she, she has a very extremely powerful story that we're going to hear about in this show today. And uh, she's spoken all across the country. She's been on many programs, many documentaries across the country. She's inspired and changed the hearts and minds of many people around the world on different continents, including politicians. And she's an attorney, a mother of five, and an all-around wonderful person. She didn't put that in her bio. I did. And she helps pregnancy rape victims all across the world to choose life. So I love your story, Rebecca. Welcome to our show. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. And I want to talk uh, about your story. I mean, Whew, it's a powerful story and it's an emotional story and many people can learn so much from this story and just hear that one life, wherever you come from, whoever you are, whatever circumstances you came into this world by, you can change the world in some way. You can make a difference. Your life has dignity. Your life has value. And I want to talk about that specifically today. So maybe you can begin by uh, sharing with us your story, uh, maybe giving us an overview. I know that you were adopted. Your mother tried to abort you, but like, how did all, all that come about? How did you find out about all of that in the first place? Well, I grew up knowing that I was adopted. I was actually adopted and raised in a Jewish family. They were secular Jews, but I went to five years of Hebrew school, three days a week. I was by mitzvah, um, but God was irrelevant in our household, kind of like when people send their kids to catechism, but they don't do any of it at home. And, um, you know, my parents only went on the high holidays, right? Uh, kind of like the Christmas and Easter folks, you know, that was my parents with the their Judaism. And, um, I wanted to sort of find my people in Hebrew school. I was uh, called names and told that wasn't really one of them. Um, you know, the family tree, I, I knew this wasn't really my lineage. And I, I had lots of family killed in the Holocaust and I empathized with them. But again, like I knew these weren't my people. And I remember seeing the movie Roots where Alex Haley you know, talked about going back to Africa generations to find their, and I wanted to find my roots and where I fit into this world and into God's plan, if at all. So I petitioned at 18 and eventually uh, got non-identifying information and learned how I was conceived because of the description. There was like a, it was like a police description for my biological a lot of details about my brother. And my, my caseworker then told me that I was conceived in rape, that that's what my birth mother indicated. Um, I met her when I was 19, and that's when I learned the horrible details that she was abducted at night point by a serial rapist. Wow. So, <laughs> I, and how did you, like, what was your feelings? What were your reactions when you found that out? 
Well, as I said, this was kind of my journey for identity. And um, it, it was, you know, kind of, uh, it was very difficult for me. I, I had felt for many years like the feather in the movie from Forrest Gump, like I was just floating and all these people were sort of pulling strings on my life and just, you know, everything was just kind of haphazard. And I thought that this would help me to be grounded, you know, finding my roots would ground me. And, um, you know, now looking back, I know like this is the idea of sort of building your house on sand versus on the rock of Christ. And um, that was, you know, that experience for me that, the, you know, the storms came and everything was just kind of washed away. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I always heard the term product of rape. So it's like, you know, that sort of became my identity. Like, what does that mean about who I am? Do I have this ugliness looking inside of me? I felt like, oh my goodness, does this mean I'm tainted? Um, and, and I sort of like cried for my birth. Like I knew I had some sort of value, but I didn't really know what it was. Like I knew I deserved to be alive because I knew what people said about abortion in cases of rape, but like I didn't know what that was. And I sort of determined that I was going to prove my work that if I could make myself attractive and successful, then people would look at me and say, oh, clearly Rebecca shouldn't have been aborted. And that was sort of how I was going to prove my worth by the measure of the world standards of success and value. Very interesting. And so um, I guess that's why you became an attorney, <clears throat> an attorney and was successful and you had everything you wanted. But how did you actually work through that and find your value and realize that you were meant to be here and that every life has a purpose? Well, so the day that I learned how I was conceived, one of the first things I did was to call. I looked up right to life. I'd always heard that phrase, you know, right to life. And I, I looked them up in the phone book and I made a call to a local right to life office um, because I just wanted to talk to someone who valued me, um, who believed that I deserved to be alive. And the woman on the other end of the phone spoke words of value into my life at a time when I was really hurting. And I, re I remember her talking about the story of Joseph, that what man meant for evil, God can use for good. And I learned that story in Hebrew school, of course, um, how his brothers sold him into slavery. But it's really been in, you know, sort of Christian circles that I hear repeatedly, um, this idea that what man meant for evil, God can use for good. And, and that's just like kind of a, a you know, a paradigm shift to have this world view. And so that was sort of the beginning, but ultimately I found my identity, value and purpose in Christ. Um, I was beat up when I was in law school by a boyfriend from law school and he broke my jaw, I ended up losing my front tooth, horrible. But through that experience, I was invited to Catholic church. Um, I had first come to know Christ in high school, sort of fell away um, through a, a, you know, an evangelical type church. And then in, in law school, someone invited me to mass with a group of young adults and they shared their faith with me and um, sang Amazing Grace. I broke down because I, I was no longer dealing just with what had been done to me and learning my story. Um, people who hurt me, you know, in my past, but now I was dealing with my own choices and, um, you know, my own sin that, you know, tainted me and ended up in RCIA. And the very first scripture we were given was how it's in the spirit of adoption that we're called to be God's children through Christ. That was preparing us for the rite of welcoming and explaining how we become like a member of the body of Christ in the spirit of adoption. And that was revolutionary for me because I'd always felt like adoption was second best last resort, that my parents' adoption story was all about their infertility. And I knew that um, 
they wouldn't have adapted me if they didn't have to. Um, there was no sort of like big picture worldview that God created me and a special plans for me and placed me in my family, nothing like that. It was all about sort of all these people and things being orchestrated and another family was supposed to adopt me first, but they wanted a boy, not a girl. And my parents were like, oh, we already have a boy. We'll take a girl. I mean, I just felt like a commodity. So that was revolutionary to hear that adoption is God's first choice and meant for the body of Christ. I'd always heard that the Jewish people were God's chosen. So to hear um, that all of us are God's chosen and then to learn later about the family tree when, you know, St. Paul talks about um, that how we're grafted in to the family tree, essentially. Um, and then I, I learned about Ruth in the Old Testament, you know, when she says that your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And I was now able to embrace my Jewish background. And instead of feeling rejected by them, so I'm going to reject you. It was like, no, your your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And now I'm so grateful for how how that Jewish background has enriched my faith today. Amen to that. And it's very interesting. Um, we had a former Jewish convert. I'm sure you know him, Roy Showman, on our channel. And uh, he has a book called Salvation is from the Jews. And it's amazing. It actually was written to try to prove Judaism, but it ended up, <laughs> in my opinion, proving Christianity, but kind of showing how we both, you know, have the same God and uh, how we come from Judaism. And there are older brothers in the faith and that sort of thing. So it's kind of beautiful in that aspect. Um, now, what was your adoptive parents? Um, what was their attitude toward? abortion toward being conceived in rape and that sort of thing? So immediately I asked my adoptive father, you know, how do you feel about abortion? What about in cases of rape? And he said to me, well, I've always felt like, who am I to say what a woman can or cannot do with her own body? I guess I'd have to say I've always been pro-choice. And immediately I challenged him like, but dad, you raised me 18 years. You watched me grow up. Like you really need to say that my birth mother's body, her choice are more important than my whole entire life. Like really, dad, you really believe that? And it was like, he instantly snapped out of it. And he said, no, I don't believe that. Wow. How would I ever get to a point where I would believe such a thing? And he started to talk about how as a professor, on a liberal campus that it was just expected that if you were progressive minded, you would be pro-choice, but he had never stopped to consider mm -hmm. the ramifications of that position as an adoptive father. Yeah, that's Which powerful. I, so I learned at a minimum at 18 that my story had the potential to change hearts and mm -hmm. minds. And, and I set out to do that, I mean, for sure. But, um, you know, I, part of it, like I said, was proving my worth to people. Yeah. Now, I, like, I know my worth. I'm grounded. I know that, you know, I, I'm not a product of rape, but a child of God. I know that the rapist is not my creator. God created me for a purpose, which was not to be aborted. I actually had someone in, in my church parking lot say that to me. She was really upset that the church had a petition, pro-life petition drive, and we got on the subject. She actually said, you know, because I asked her, did God not create me? And she stopped to think about it. I'm like, what are you thinking? Like, where in the, does it suggest that Satan creates children? And she's like, all right, I'll give you that. <laughs> okay, give credit where credit's due. You know, God and I, thank you. Um, and then I said, and did God not create me for a purpose? And she said, she thought about it and she said, I just think that God might create some children for the purpose of being a boy. No, 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 no. He created me for good and not for evil. And he Amen. knew the plans he had for my life. And, um, <laughs> you know, and, and there's people who say, well, you know, oh, she's promoting rape. They call me a rape apologist that I'm pro-rape. And if I cared about my birth mother at all, I would have killed myself a long time ago. And, um, I'm called a rape trophy. And, rape baby, all those kinds of things. And um, 
they'll suggest that, you know, oh, you know, if you say God created you, God planned you, oh, God's pro-rape. Like, no, that's ludicrous. It's like, you can be pro, <laughs> yeah, you can, you can be pro-law enforcement, but not pro-crime, even though it's true that if it weren't for crime, there'd be no law enforcement. I mean, that's the way they act, you know, um, because I'm, I'm pro-life, I value my life, therefore I must be pro-rape. It's just ludicrous. But you know, we have a worldview that knows that, you know, God doesn't intend the evil, but he can take the evil that occurs and he can use it for good. He can, he, he trades beauty for ashes, as it says um, in scripture in the Old Testament. And, and that's what God does. I mean, God's not pro-crucifixion, you know, but he can take what man meant for evil and use it for good. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my goodness. Our culture is so evil. I mean, the Bible says that it's not a battle of flesh and blood, but it's a battle of powers and spirits and principalities. And this is, you know, a battle of good versus evil in many ways. And unfortunately, there are tons of casualties within our culture and in our society of people who have just fallen for these lies, who have fallen for this worldview and really have are really mean people themselves, you know, and I used to hate these people back in the day when I used to dress in black and I used to carry weapons and I hated the world. And I wanted to basically off everyone who would basically be mean to me. And, but then after God healed my life, I mean, transformed it inside out and backwards, like St. Paul, um, I looked out at these same people and I said, wow, these are, these people have also been abused. They've also been really hurt. They've also been really devastated. Like, I mean, I was hurt. I was bullied. I was abused. I was a lot of things. And I realized I was so angry, but they are too. And so I, I've set out in my own journey to help kind of like you to make a difference in the world, to share the love of Jesus, to transform people's hearts, minds, uh, help them to find the happiness that I've found. But wow, it's, it's sometimes hard because they say such evil things to you and their logic, the logic of the society today is just abominable. It doesn't follow. I mean, to say that, you know, your life has value means you must love rape. That doesn't even make sense on any planet. And so it's really sad to me that this, you know, that our society has devolved intellectually into this kind of apologetics. And, and you have to stay grounded in what, you know, God really has to say about who you are. Um, because otherwise, like you take those arrows and, you know, it's, it'll destroy you. Like those are storms that come. And again, if your house is built on sand, you're not going to be able to withstand it. And, you know, so we put on that full armor of God, right? And we have to be grounded. Our roots, you know, are in who we are in Christ. Yeah. That's our identity. We have to know who we are. Amen to that. Now, you know who you are, and I know this is very personal to you, this whole subject, but, you know, what do you feel and how do you think personally, since it's so personal to you, when you hear people talk about abortion and making exceptions for rape and different things like that, as if it's like the be all and end all, it's an absolute must, like, you know, how do you feel when you hear that? And there are people who say, well, it's nothing against you personally. Like, well, you see, the thing is, I am a person and it doesn't get more personal than saying that, you know, you should be dead right now. So yeah, I'm going to take it personally. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's not about me. There's, there's also people who will say like, you know, oh, look at Rebecca, like it's just me, myself and I, like the world would not revolve if she weren't in it. Like, it's not about you, you know, like that's how people talk to me on social media. So I, I block them. I mean, that, that, it's not good discourse. It's not healthy. It's toxic. It is. It is. And I, I'm not going to subject myself to that. So I, I do ban and delete in that case, but, um, you know, I'm trying to reach people in the middle right now who are reasonable or open for it. Cause it's like, it's, it's like the, the parable of the sower, you know, I, I'm sowing, I want to sow seeds on good soil. Right. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's 
it is painful. It, it's a lot to take. So I, I have to like replenish and refill. Um, but it's, it's not about me. You see, because like the easiest thing to do would be able to just live my life. And, you know, at least I got to be born too bad for the rest. Oh, I can't do that. I mean, can you sit there and say, well, at least I was wanted. At least I was conceived out of two loving parents and just too bad for the rest. That's it. You no, know, I subject myself to ridicule um, because I know that there is nothing about me that makes me more special and more worthy and deserving of life than anybody else. You know, I feel like my life was spared from a burning building. And as I have the opportunity to go back and save others, I'm going to do it. You know, we are told to rescue those who are being led away to death, hold back those who are staggering towards slaughter. And if you say that we knew nothing of this, does not he who guards your life know it? You know, will he not repay each person according to what he's done? And and um, you know, what do I have to lose? I mean. You know, people, people will also say like, it's only 1%, right? You've heard that before. You know, it's only 1%. That's like the worst thing you could possibly say, by the way. It just sounds so uncaring. And, um, and it just makes it easier for politicians to sacrifice the one, you know? And there are leaders in the pro-life movement who are willing to sacrifice the one. And they'll say, you know, burning building analogy, you know, you save the 99 in exchange for the one, you know, wouldn't you save as many as you? And I hear the 99, the one, I think of the parable of the lost sheep, where he says in context, in context, see that you do not despise any of these little ones. He was talking about letting the little ones come to him. And, you know, what a strange thing to say, like who would despise little ones? But I, I told you the things, the names I'm called and, and getting called rapist child, never rape victim's child, um, horrible reminder, demon seed, evil seed, Satan spawn, child of the devil, monster's child, you know, and then systematically targeted for annihilation globally. I mean, we, we are despised. My people group are despised as well as like children with special needs, disabled children in the world, you know. But absolutely. if you don't mind me jumping in real quick, uh, it's like when I'm hearing this, I'm hearing the, like such an oxymoron, such a, you know, uh, it's so interesting that the people attacking you and saying that you're devil spawn, you're evil, you're d doomed to, to be destroyed. Who's doing this? It's the devil himself who hates life so much that he wants to destroy it. He knows that was your weakness back in the day. So he wants to try to take you out. And sometimes he speaks through other people, but the, it's the devil who hates this life. And so therefore is trying to undermine it, is trying to you know, say that it's, it's not good. It's not beautiful. It's not holy. It's not from God when in fact it is. So the father of lies is speaking, not only lies to you, but to all the people who may have been conceived in rape or disabilities and that sort of thing. I mean, he's been speaking this for generations. I mean, we did a whole uh, YouTube video and I've done several articles on Margaret Sanger and how she hated charities. She hated the Catholic church because they helped people who were sick and who were maimed and who had uh, intellectual disabilities and things like that. She thought they should have just been left to die so we could have a, a, a more perfect evolved civilization, very similar to the ideology of Hitler. But um, they were saying that these people had no worth and they couldn't understand the Catholic church who worked with these people and said, no, they have an infinite dignity. And so I just want to, that's just so interesting that, you know, th they're calling you evil when in fact it's evil that's calling you evil. <laughs> right, right. Woe to those who call good, evil, evil. Yeah. And, you know, they, the thief came to steal, kill and destroy. And um, I, I know that. But, um, okay, so, so Jesus said, um, see that you do not despise any of these little ones, for I tell you their angels in heaven always look down the face of my Father in heaven. And then he goes right into the whole parable of the lost sheep, where the good shepherd leaves the 99 to save the one. And he finishes the parable by explaining its point. And he says, for in the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any 
of these little ones should perish and neither should we. So in context, Christ was talking about little ones who are despised, who are at risk of perishing. And he's not willing that any should perish. And when you are willing to sacrifice the one and, you know, for political expediency, like you're saying, we're willing. Um, when you risk the one, when, when all aren't protected, none are protected. Um, and it's, you know, it's very demoralizing, dehumanizing. I mean, not just when you have, um, you, you know, you know, people are lost when they're calling you names, you know who they're serving and you, and you know that they're just lost and they don't know better. But it's really hard to take that so-called friendly fire from, you know, Gallup polls show that that 60% um, of pro-lifers make their rape exemption. And then even of the, you know, pro-life people who don't, you have a huge number of them who are willing to sacrifice the one for political expediency. And I'm from Michigan where we've never had a rape exception in a single law because Right to Life Michigan said, we're not doing that. Um, and you have people in the Catholic church in the hierarchy of the Catholic church you have, you have some who are willing to sacrifice the one and you have others who are not. And you know, I can tell you who my heroes are, <laughs> but uh, that friendly fire hurts a lot um, because I feel like they should know better. And the heart of God is clear uh, in that passage of scripture. And, and that's why my organization's called Save the One. Mm. And make sure to check that out, people. Save the one. Um, we'll give you all of our information down below in the description section. But, you know, it's so interesting that, you know, I give pro-life talks, too. And when I give pro-life talks, I start out in a different sort of way. You know, it sounds like I'm bragging and I just tell everything good that I've done. <laughs> you know, I, I've counseled so many people who were suicidal or who were on a cliff or who were cutting themselves or who were abused or who were had so many different issues. I've literally helped hundred, probably thousands of people and I've turned so many lives around. I've brought so many lives into the Catholic church and I go on and on and on and on. And then I tell people that when I was uh, conceived, people told my mother to abort me. And I tell them that because if I was aborted, who was going to talk that person off the cliff? Who would have been there to talk the razor out of that person's hand? Who would have been there for this and this and this and this? And how would these lives have been changed? God has made each and every one of us for a reason. He has made everyone for a purpose. And we're all here for that purpose. And we're all destined to go to heaven and live eternally with God. And so the girl who changed my life, I told you I used to dress in black, carry weapons, incredibly angry, volatile. The, the, the girl who changed my life was also conceived and raped. And that's always been very powerful for me because if she had not been born, nobody else, and I had a lot of people in my life, nobody else could break through my heart of stone. She was the one who broke through my heart of stone. She was the one who got me to open up. She was the one who allowed God to rush into my life. Even though I've been Catholic my whole life, prayed every day, prayed a rosary, still was angry and hateful and resentful. Nice kid, just didn't know what to do with all the depression and anger. She was the one who got through to me. And a, a, a girl who was conceived in rape has so much power, has so much value, it changes. I, she was one of the most popular girls at school. And I watched her change life after life after life. And people are saying she should have died. People are saying are you, you should. Go ahead. Are you still in touch with her? Um, no, not recently. No. Just. I would love to meet her. You know, that, that's a great testimony. And I, I hope that she knows this, that she could hear you saying this. Yeah. And um, it's possible that I could get in touch with her again, because I know I'm still friends with friends who are friends with her. But um, and I could possibly, you know, get you two together. But, you know, we could talk about that after. Yeah. Like I said, I, I literally have a network of over 1,100 of us. So I, I love meeting other people. And that's our tribe, our community. Um, I've met people, oh, almost everybody I've met who's conceived and raped is already, you know, actively pro-life. I mean, they're involved in their local pregnancy center or they're involved in orphan care or they're doing, 
they're a force of good in some way. There's, I've met a number of pastors um, and there's a, a priest in, in Ecuador who has conceived in rape. And um, there's so many that are really a force of good around the world, great humanitarians. Um, but there are, I've met a few who over the years who were suicidal. One was um, in Australia, another one in Germany. Both of these young women saying horrible things about themselves. They learned how they were conceived and they were calling themselves those, those bad things. And, um, you know, feeling tainted, feeling worthless, feeling, you know, feeling the weight of you know, all those things that everybody else says they were carrying that. And in, um, in both cases, I said to them, is that how you see me? Because I, you know, we have a support group for people with these stories. And, and I asked, is that how you see me? And both of them individually said to me, oh, gosh, no. No, like, you know, you're my hero. Like, oh my gosh, you're such a good person. No, I'm like, I don't see you there. And I'm like, well, do you realize when you say those horrible things about yourself, because you were conceived and right, you're saying those things about me? They're like, oh, I, I would never say those things about you. Like, that's what you're doing. And in each instance, they, they took the time to contemplate that and came back to me and said, you helped me to see my own worth because I, I realized what I was doing. And, you know, you being sort of that role model for me to be able to see that you're someone of value helped me to realize that I'm a person of value. And I've had people who weren't conceived in rape who, who also said the same kind of thing. Um, I've also had people who weren't conceived in rape tell me that they were envious of me because they said that they could see that I had such a purpose in my life mm -hmm. and that I, I know what my purpose is, you know, to, to save others and to, you know, make a difference in this world. And here they had sort of a perfect life, cradle Catholic, and, and they're, they feel like they're floundering because they don't know what their purpose is. Like that's, you know, that, that's an interesting dichotomy, isn't it? But, but every single per person does have a Absolutely. 100%. And I see it over and over and over again. And so you're helping so many people and that's fantastic. And could you talk a little bit more about that? Just how you have helped so many people, what you're doing, even maybe some of the minds that you've changed, you know, some of the higher ups, you know, the impact that you're having with your story ever since your, your father, you're like, wow, I can't change lives. You know, how have you done that? So and, you know, and first of all, we're told again, like, we love because Christ first loved us. And, and I'm able to do this now because um, I know love. Like, I know love from Christ. And so now I'm able to show love and I'm able to really you know, bear fruit. Because for years, like, I wasn't bearing fruit. Like, I wasn't in the vine, right? Um, you know, apart from me, you can do nothing, he said. And, and I, I was not doing anything you know when I was like trying to prove my worth it wasn't until I became part of the vine that God was able to use me and I was able to you know bear fruit I was able to show love because like I know love right we love because Christ first loved us um so I'm I'm in a bunch of documentaries but I'm in one that's a Citizens United film The Gift of Life with Governor Mike Huckabee mine is one of several stories featured in the film so I had backstage passes to the premiere in glamorous Des Moines Iowa <laughs> um, and I introduced myself to each of the four presidential candidates who were speaking because it was held right in between two Iowa caucuses and so there was Michelle Bachman, former uh, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, and former U.S. Senator Rick Santorum, uh, former Texas Governor, then Texas Governor Rick Perry, and former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich. Uh, so I introduced myself to each tool them I'm in tonight's film. I gave them my DVDs, Conceived and Rape, From Worthless to Priceless, our group DVD, uh, Accepting Cases of Rape, 
12 Stories of Survival, and my business card, Conceived in Rape, Targeted for Abortion. You know, subtle. <laughs> and um, right away, uh, Santorum and Bachman said, I told them that I'm the national spokeswoman for personhood. And right away, Bachman and Santorum said, oh, I signed the personhood pledge. It was a presidential pet pledge, came out two days before, no exceptions, no compromise pledge. And um, I said, you know, yes, I know. Thank you so much. Perry and Gingrich had not signed pledge because they were both avowed to be rape exception candidates. And nine months earlier, Governor Perry had signed a ultrasound bill with a rape exception in it. It didn't even say that a woman had to view an ultrasound before her abortion. It just said that she be, had to be given the opportunity, that she had to be told that she had the opportunity to view it. But somehow it was so offensive to suggest such a thing to a rape victim that she wasn't afforded that information that she would have that opportunity. So they had a rape exception. I mean, that's just nuts, right? Yeah. So, you know, he, yeah, they, rape exceptions galore in Texas up to that point. And so right away he was stunned and he asked me, this is your story? And I shared with him a little how I was conceived and almost aborted. And he, he asked me, can I have your autograph? <laughs> no. And he said, no, I mean it. Here, make it out to my daughter and handed me a marker. So I wrote 100% pro-life, Rebecca Kiesling. And he asked me more questions. And I told him some of the work that I do as an attorney. I've litigated high profile cases defending life. I have this global network and I, I you know, fight to defend rape victims and their children from the rapist having parental rights. I've been behind the Rape Survivor Child Custody Act. And you know, I, I have been a force of good in this world, I think. He, he said to me, you know, you're my heroine. Like, wow, thank you so much. But it's funny you say that, because my question for you is, would you be my hero? And he said, yes, yes, I, I would. But you make that rape exception. And he put his head down and he was shaking his head, still holding the DVDs. And he was saying, wow, this is so powerful. This is so powerful. And he was thinking about it. I didn't know how much time I had. I knew other people were waiting. So I said, I want to get my photo taken with you, but my battery's dead. And he said, well, I'm my own personal photographer. You know, Come with me. And we went in his green room and they took tons of photos, which he never sent me. <laughs> but he used footage of, of me himself and Governor um, Huckabee in his ad campaign. But he was, he was looking at the camera as we're standing there, looking at the photos, just saying, I just can't imagine. I just can't imagine. And I looked up at him and I explained that when you make that rape exception, that's like saying to me that I deserved the death penalty for the crime of my biological father. The US Supreme Court said that he didn't even deserve the death penalty. At Coker v. Georgia, they said that rapists don't deserve the death penalty. And Kennedy v. Louisiana, they said that even for child molesters, it's cruel and unusual punishment. And, I, and he was nodding his head when I asked him, so how do I, the innocent child, deserve the death penalty? And he, he, he That's said, powerful. And he said, no, no, I, I, I don't. And then I'm like, well, <laughs> and he, he stopped me, he put his hand out and stopped me and he said, you know, tonight's event in this film are supposed to be all about changing hearts and minds. And right now you're changing my heart. And I thought, hmm, changing? Like, what's that supposed to mean? And I had friends on Facebook telling me that they were praying for me, saying, you're going to have an Esther moment. I just know it for such a time as this. 
And I was not about to miss it. And of course, you know the story of Esther, right? You know, the whole book in the Old Testament, how, and anybody who's watched like Veggie Tales of Esther with their kids, it's really great, right? So, um, you know, she went before the king and she wasn't supposed to go uninvited, but she used this opportunity she had in front of him um, to save her people because her people were going to be slaughtered and she had to be brave in that moment to, to you know, save her people. And um, so I challenged him. no more rape exception. And Governor Perry looked me in the eye and he promised no more rape exception. And he went on to say that he had just never considered it from the perspective of someone like me. I mean, he's the governor of Texas running for president. You think he's never heard the arguments? But it goes to show what faces, voices, and stories can do to pierce the heart in ways in which arguments cannot. That's why Jesus shared stories. You know, he didn't, didn't just talk doctrine. Any lessons he had were in the context of stories. And um, the next morning, he signed the personhood pledge. And so did Newt Gingrich. Even though oh. Newt Gingrich didn't tell me to my face that my story had changed his heart. He later gave, wrote about it and gave credit to me in this film for changing his heart on this issue. But Governor Perry, over the next couple of weeks, he was asked, like, you signed this personhood pledge. Like, you make a rape exception. And he shared our conversation, how my story changed his heart, saying that he wow. couldn't look me in the eyes and justify the rape exception anymore. Wow. That's so powerful. <clears throat> it's like such an ideology. It's a talking point. It's something we repeat over and over. But when you make it real, then you realize that it is a real person with a you know a eternal soul from God Almighty. That's powerful. And, and he went back and he changed the culture of his state. They passed some of the toughest laws in the country. No rape exception. Rape exceptions were over in Texas from that point forward. Wow. Wow, that's powerful. I know we're coming to the end of our show, but do you mind if I ask you one more question? Sure. Um, it's, it's just something I was thinking of. Well, oh, I have so many more questions, but they say that, you know, if you haven't, if you're raped, you should be able to have an abortion because then you're going to, you know, have to carry that child and think of, you know, their circumstance and that sort of thing. And they say you're going to be happier if you have an abortion, whereas I've heard rape counselors say it's in fact the complete and total opposite that if you go on to have the baby, something beautiful comes out of something so tragic. Whereas if you have an abortion, you have decades of regret because you know why you couldn't have prevented something violent from happening to you. You went on and did something violent to someone else. And it actually reminds me, that's so powerful when you said the rapist doesn't get the death penalty, but you do. It's like, it doesn't make any in sense. In Deuteronomy, it says you are not to punish the child for the sins of the father. That yeah. each is punished for his own sin. I mean, that's biblical. So what did I, what I say, does that, is that, do you find that correct in your experience that women who have abortions after that end up regretting it and people who have the baby, is that accurate or is maybe not? Yeah, we have over 250 blogs written and we have as part of our network, post abortive women from rape who regret aborting, who will say that the abortion was worse than the rape. They'll say that, that it was more violence in their body in the exact place where they were just harmed. And that they were no longer dealing with what had been done with what they did to their own child. Um, most women vow never to tell another soul when they've been raped. And what the abortion does is it solidifies that, that they're gonna hide it and not tell anybody. But when they have the baby, they now need to tell their family what happened. And they're able to get healing and counseling that they never would have otherwise gotten if it hadn't been for that baby. They talk about how that baby was a light and they, when they had felt all alone after being raped, they now felt like they had a little angel to keep them company during their time of healing. Um, and they proved themselves better than the rapist. And 
that there is something very healing of having something beautiful come out of something really awful. But studies show that rape victims are four times more likely to die within the next year after the abortion. They have a higher murder rate, higher rate of abuse, depression, and on and on, because more violence does not bring healing. It's absurd to think that it does. Um, as far as the pregnant 10 year old, people are always asking this question. Look, the younger a girl is, the more likely it is that it's someone in the household or a family member who's been raping her. And the more likely it is that it's been going on for years. And guess who exposes the rape? It's the baby. When she delivers the baby, the baby delivers her out of that abusive situation. That's what studies show. But oftentimes her own mother takes her to the abortion clinic. But, and quite often the perpetrator takes her to the abortion clinic to destroy the evidence. But a lot of times her own mother takes her either because her mother might be trafficking her or her mother is embarrassed that she left her unprotected and doesn't want everybody to know that she, you know, she was a bad mother and didn't protect her daughter. And she's trying to you know, save face in the community. Um, or her mother's really just trying to protect her boyfriend or her husband or her brother or whoever. And it's the baby who's the one who ends up protecting her. Um, we posted a video just recently on Save the Want, a woman that I met through Abby Johnson, and then there were none. She's like a, what they call a quitter. She used to work in the abortion clinic for years. And she talked about uh, the, the fact that they did not report these rapes and that there was a 10-year-old that the doctor wanted her to hold her down, put her body across the 10-year-old and force this abortion on her. And the girl ran out, did not want the abortion, was screaming and, and kicked herself out of the stirrups and, and ran off. And she, and she said how guilty she felt, but that they never reported anything. They didn't want the police coming to the clinics. They didn't want to scare everybody and, and look bad. So they never reported it. And that's really common. Live action has done these X days. Um, exactly. And if you Google rape yeah. And if you Google rapist love abortion, you'll see over and over again, documented cases that we have shared. I could Google alerts, case after case after case in the news where another abortion, another abortion, another abortion kept protecting and enabling the rape to continue. Sex traffickers, child molesters, and rapists love abortion. They cannot continue perpetrating without the abortion clinic. The other thing about the young girl is the younger she is, the more likely it is that she's very far along in her pregnancy. And I get that people want to spare her having to go through labor. They'll say that uh, correctly, that if you force her to carry full term, that it's dangerous to her life or health. That's true. But what they don't disclose is that's never been standard of care. You always deliver about four weeks early. And with a late-term abortion, she's going to have to go through labor and delivery. And it's much more difficult. You have to dilate her cervix. It's a three-day procedure. And she's in this twilight state. But she, she's delivering a dead baby. You're not sparing her labor. Because that's what people think. You know, but she's having to give birth to a dead instead. So the question is whether it's a live baby or a dead baby. And the dead baby does not. So powerful, so powerful. And uh, I just want to thank you for all that you do. I want to thank you for your life. I want to thank you for your witness. I want to thank you for actually caring for that one, for that person in the womb. And I know you do what you do because you care for them. You know, yeah, you had a chance of life. Oh, who cares about everyone else? No, you do care about everyone else. And I think that's beautiful. And you want to help people. And so thank you for your life. Thank you for your ministry and for saying yes to God. Thank you. and. Um... I, I just want to, one last thought is, um, you know, I know my worth today. And if I want to show my worth, I, I don't open up my, you know, checkbook and show my portfolio or anything like that. Um, it's not my assets versus my liabilities or my successes versus my failures. And it's not, you know, the good I've done versus my sin. I know my worth and I can just point to the crucifix. Like that's my worth. That's Amen. the infinite price that he paid for my life. 
I know my worth and I hope all of your listeners, people who are watching, tuning in, I hope that they know your worth. Amen. And uh, that's very powerful as well, because sometimes people only discover that when they lose everything. They're like, I've lost everything. I have nothing. And some people be, become suicidal, like millionaires. There's so many billionaires, millionaires commit suicide if they lose everything. And it's like, because they don't realize their worth. They think it's built up in their money. When in fact, when you lose everything, then you sometimes you see what actually is true that God is still looking at you, smiling on you, saying, I love you, my child. You have an infinite worth and dignity independent of anything and everything else. And that's, and I hope I agree with you. DVD. That's why my DVD is called um, From Worthless to Priceless. Oh, know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So why don't you tell uh, everybody uh, where they can find you and maybe some of the recommendations that you can give and I'll put them in the description section below. Well, Rebecca Kiesling, and that's K-I-E-S-S-L-I-N-G, RebeccaKiesling.com. You can Google me and you'll find a plethora of, um, you know, articles and videos uh, that you can feel free to share. Live Action did a really good video recently. My Rebecca Kiesling Pro-Life Speaker page, you'll see right at the top, I have a 10-minute video pinned. And it's my testimony on the heartbeat bill in South Carolina before the, the Senate. That's a, a good short, you know, clip to share. Um, my organization, Save the One, and that's the number one, not the word one, and that's savetheone.com. Our Facebook page, we have lots of great resources for sharing memes, stories on our blog, videos on the website, and on what our was Facebook the name of that DVD you had just mentioned? Um, Conceived and Rape from Worthless to Priceless. Thank you. And a group DVD, except in cases, rapes, tools, rules, survivor. We have another group DVD that's out there, um, at conceived in rape and other exceptions that's on YouTube. Um, so yeah, you know, you can, you can find my story. And if you have a difficult case story, conceived in rape, incest, sex trafficking, or became pregnant, you know, you're, whether you're a birth mother, you raise that child or post abortive, there's a place for you. Um, we have separate groups for, for all these different stories. And if uh, we have a carrier to birth group. So if doctors told you to abort or told your parents to abort you um, for, you know, medical reasons, we have a group, you know, for you and for that. And we, we love to share your stories. Um, like I said, we have you know, hundreds of blogs and um, I, so they write and I do a phone call and I get to spend time with them and ask follow-up questions and help, you know, make the story really solid and then we publish that and send it off and they, we have a, a spanish page over a hundred thousand followers on our spanish page and wow. we have a Praise spanish blog. we also have a portuguese page on facebook so um you know it's a it's a global network people all over the world with these stories and it that's our tribe you know what's important to have each other especially in these days because everybody since roe was overturned everybody talks about rape so much more now what about rape and, and it's important to be able to lend support to each other lean on each other not feel alone amen you've built up a whole empire one person who has a mission has helped to build an empire and helped countless people. So that is the power of one life people. That is the power of one soul. That is the power of what God can do in any and everyone's life. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've come from, where you've been, how many mistakes you've made, what you think your worth is, how much you've lost, how much you've sinned. It does not matter. God can change the world with you if you let him. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for coming on our show. We are so glad to have had you. Thanks so much for having me. Right. And thank you all for watching and tuning into this wonderful and powerful testimony. Please check out her uh, information down below in the show description notes. And please also check out our <clears throat> uh, show notes. If you haven't been here before, please like this video, share it with everyone you know, because these type of videos get nerfed by YouTube because they don't like the content. So we're certainly not going to be monetized. So if you would like to support us, you can see our PayPal and our Patreon down below, and you can help us by liking it and sharing it. And uh, last but not least, if you would like a retreat speaker, a uh, someone to come to your church or parish, check out Rebecca Kiesling. She uh, travels around and gives talks. And so do we. Thank you all. Please keep us in your prayers as we are always praying for you. God bless you. Thank you.